Praise the Lord. Shall we rise up to pray? Our God in heaven, we thank you very much for the Bible study today. Thank you because you brought us so that you can keep on teaching us, instructing us, and leading us in the way of righteousness. Lord, we pray that all these things we learn will be beneficial to every one of our lives and families, fathers, mothers, children, husbands, and wives, in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, that even the widows will not be left out, that the teaching of the word of God will be beneficial to everyone, and the young people, the children, the teenagers, the youths, that your blessing to you of studying the word and living by the word will be to every one of us in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that you will not study in vain, will not read in vain, will not come to church in vain, but at the end of the days, when the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise, and the people of God shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Lord, we pray, ours will be the privilege of being with the Lord on that wonderful day in Jesus' name. Once again tonight, open the scriptures to every one of us. Help us to see. Help us to know. Help us to learn. And give us the grace to do what you are teaching us every time. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. You can sit down. We come back to you First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3. We've been studying on the family on marriage for some weeks now. And tonight we come to something very central. Something in concluding. Something that looks like a climax. Something that is indispensable. Something you need in your heart, in your life. And this is something that we have here on earth and something that goes on not only on earth, but even when we get to heaven. It's a very characteristic of God as we look at the great union in heaven. The union between the Father and the Son. You find this quality of love. As you find, as you look at the union between the angels of God, you find this quality of love. And as you look at here on earth, the most beautiful thing and the most essential thing and the most necessary thing here on earth, you'll find is this quality of love. You'll find in human family, there's something that is distinct, that separates us, that sets us apart from the animal kingdom, that is from the animals, whether they are dogs or goats or sheep or birds or fish or whatever it is, creeping things on earth. This is the one thing that sets us apart distinguishes us human beings from the animals and that is love as we think about the very many, many things we have here on earth we have faith on earth when we get to heaven and we see everything as it is and, and as it shall ever be there will be no need for faith then we have hope and as we get to heaven eventually, it is something because you are hoping for something that is still ahead of you. And when you have got it, why hope for it again? There will be no need for hope. But this quality of love that we find in our human lives now, our unions now, our fellowship now, our relationship now, in the church, in the family, everywhere, this love so central, this love so essential, so important, this love that if you don't have, then you are nothing different from the animal kingdom. You know the animals, the animals act on instinct. That is uh, the thing that is built into them. And whatever instinct, instinct, maybe we we'll call it feeling, emotion, and whatever urge they have in their mind, we can't say in their hearts, those are animals. Whatever urge they have inside them, they jump up, they run up, they pounce on other animals like themselves. 
because they are animals. And if you do not have this one we're talking about, then how are you different? If you act on urge, instinct, and you act on feeling, and you act on emotion, and you do not act on basic knowledge of how we live, why we live, what we're living for, then how will you be different from animals? But if there's anything that marks us out from the animal kingdom and makes us very different and we act differently, it is this characteristic of love. And this human love comes to its climax, comes to its culmination, comes to its height, its peak in the marriage union that is in the family. And that's what we're looking at today, love in the Christian family. In First Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of their wives, when, while they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fear, verse 7, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Did you notice that? Dwell together, dwell with them, not according to feeling. You know, our feelings go up and down. Sometimes we feel great. And sometimes we feel lousy. Sometimes we feel energetic, enthused, enthusiastic. And sometimes we feel tired, weary, and fatigue but if you are acting on if you're acting on emotion if you're acting on feeling sometimes will be up sometimes will be down if you act on the way you feel if that's the thing that motivates your life when you feel good you act right when you feel bad you act evil you act negative but if you center your life not on feeling not an emotion, not on instincts like animals, but you act according to knowledge. Knowledge of what relationship is. Knowledge of what marriage ought to be. Knowledge of what the family is composed of and what makes a family really calm alive. If you act on knowledge, you can never be wrong. Because then you are acting on principle. That's why it says, likewise ye husbands dwell with them. That is, dwell with your wife. According to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife. That's one piece of knowledge. That's one area of knowledge. Giving honor unto the wife. Hey, what it means is, I have the knowledge. I have to give honor. And sometimes she's, she might not look like honorable so-and-so. She might not be a vice, a deputy governor, honorable deputy governor. She might not be the vice president of any company, honorable deputy governor. But even though she doesn't have the title, honorable Mrs. Dr. Chief so-and-so, I know that I must act according to knowledge. And what is the knowledge? The knowledge is the husband must always give honor unto the wife. And you know when we talk about this knowledge sometimes, you know when, uh, when a lady has got married and you know she's not pregnant yet and uh, she's still completely full, she's not lost, much blood, much beauty. And she looks very charming and very, very beautiful. And sometimes it's not difficult to give honor unto her. But now she's pregnant. And her shape has changed. And her look is different. And when she has given birth, you know, she looks sometimes flabby. That is, you know, before the tummy goes back to its normal shape. And looking at her, she's not like she was one and a half years ago, but act according to knowledge. The knowledge is always giving her honor. However she looks, however she is, wherever she's coming from, 
whoever is there, whoever is not there in the privacy of your room, when you and I alone are there, here is knowledge. Acting on the basis of knowledge, not feeling. Not just what you see, giving honor unto the wife. When the in-laws are there, act on knowledge. What's the knowledge? Giving honor unto the wife. And when she has done something you didn't expect her to do, giving honor unto the, unto the wife. You see, when she's done something she shouldn't do, yes. How do we give honor to uh, Mr. President in our country? Whatever you read in the papers during the day, then in the evening at an occasion, uh, Mr. President, a sex shows up and you happen to be there. Whatever you read in the papers during the day about Mr. President, you give honor. Why? Because you act according to knowledge. That's who he is. That's Mr. President. Therefore, you give the honor. Therefore, whatever your wife has done, whatever your wife is doing, if you're acting according to not, not according to feeling, what she has done might make you feel down. Not according to feeling, not according to emotion. Acting according to knowledge. Giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. And as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. That your prayers be not hindered. That your prayers be not hindered. And you know when it says that your prayers be not hindered, what a wonderful thing. We need to know the scriptures. You know sometimes it's very difficult for those who are pastors and evangelists and, and preachers to pray for their children when their children are sick. You know why? Because you see, those children know how the pastor and the evangelist, the teacher, this respected international uh, you know, proclaimer of the gospel. They know how the father, the evangelist, how he talks to their mother. And they do not have any respect for that man. And when those children are sick and then uh, mommy says, uh, daddy will come and pray for you. They say, mommy, please take me to the hospital. Because uh, daddy cannot pray. Because, uh, you know, the way she talks, uh, or oh, the Bible study the other time. And then we read that scripture, First Peter chapter 3, verse 7. That likewise, your husband, this is what you do, that your prayers be not hindered. And we don't think that God will answer, daddy, don't let us die, take us to the hospital. And you know, sometimes the servants and the maids who are living with us, sometimes it's difficult for you to pray for them, for them to be healed. You might say, I'm a member of the prayer warriors, and you know, I'm, you know I, hold, I hold a great position in the church, in the prayer team. But your maids and your servants, they know what you do at home, and they know how you, how you treat your wife. And when they have any problem, they'll rather go to the coordinator of another district because you know why? They know what goes on at home. That your prayers be not hindered. If we're going to have the attention and the ear of heaven, and we're going to be able to get our prayers answered, we need to regulate our lives and then have this love in the family. The man to the woman, the woman to the man, husband to wife, and wife to husband. Love is very central and the leading attribute that sustains the family. It's not money, no position. It's not the kind of house you're living in. It's not the kind of machinery you have. We have washing machine there. We have the fridge there. We have all the other things there. Those things, they're good, but they don't keep the family. If there's one thing that keeps the family, and that's why you find sometimes people who are poor, they have next to nothing, but they have a stable family. And if you look at the divorce rate in the world, you find that the divorce rate is higher among the people that have a lot of substance, a lot of, they have a lot of riches and wealth. Divorce 
cause is very high among them. But the villagers and the, the, the poor people, the peasants, divorce, yes, they still divorce, but it's low. Divorce rate is very low. You know why? Because money does not make marriage. It's love. And among those poor people, among those illiterates, you have people that have real love for one another. Love is the one thing that distinguishes you from animals. And then love in its depth and love in its breath is the foundation and the sustaining force of the marriage and the family where love decreases. Joy will decrease. Fulfillment will decrease. And then you'll have you know, people coming far apart. In fact, you can measure. You can measure the amount of love and the quality of love in a family family by how distant the husband and the wife is. Watch those uh, couples. As you can even measure it on the street when they are going. The closer they are, the more it looks like they have love, the more quality of love they have. But the farther apart they get, you find, you know, they, ne they never go together. They never actually stay together. They never allow the public to see them together. That will tell the amount and the quality of love they have. If you're entering to the marriage, into the marriage union, you must have love for one another. Without love, it's like a child coming into this world without a heart. And for those of you who have not gotten married, I said some things last week that, you know, made your head to start turning. When I said, yes, you must pray. Yes, you must know the will of God. But you must open your eyes and see. And because you are hearing that from me for the first time, and you said, can that be right? And I want to repeat it again. Open your eyes and see. Thank you very much. You know, there are, uh, praise the Lord. Uh, you know, there are some people, you know, they call them to the marriage committee. They say that, uh, how did you choose uh, this sister? How do you know that this is the will of God for you? Well, they will reply and say, you know, it's just the will of God. To tell you the truth, I don't have any love for her. And looking at her, I don't love her at all, at all. In fact, I prayed and prayed, God, give me love for her. I just can't find in my heart any love for her. I'm just taking her because of the will of God. Huh. You'll get into trouble. If you're going to marry a person, it's not just, I know the will of God. If it is truly the will of God, there'll be love. There'll be love. Because if there is no love, you cannot be sure of the will of God. You cannot be sure of the will of God. If you're sure of the will of God, there'll be love. It's not just faith. It's faith and love. It's prayer and love. You know, sometimes a sister is the one that is... Um, guilty of this kind of thing going to marriage without love and uh, the sister uh, has prayed a little and then the man is coming and he's saying don't you understand that you know i'm a member of the prayer warriors i pray and god answers my prayer if you have not uh, if you have not got the answer i'm telling you i never miss it i prayed for so and so this happened i prayed for the other one this happened i prayed for so and so go and check out this happened and when i prayed you God says you are the person, but I don't love you all the same. We are talking about love. I'm talking about supernatural revelation of the Almighty God to my heart that you are the one. And then the lady will go to the marriage committee and say, actually, to tell the truth, I don't, uh, I don't know, but he says it's the will of God. And he told me the track record of his praying and praying and praying. And I believe him. I believe him that's a man of prayer. I don't love him, but I'll marry him. You are going to marry trouble. Because you see, it's not just prayer. It's not just prayer. Uh, you know, I don't want to divert your attention to another. I could tell you some real prayer shots. The people that really pray, pray, and pray, and you'll be surprised at what happens. That's why Jesus said, not everyone that calls me Lord, Lord, shall inherit, shall enter into the kingdom of God. Because uh, many will say, have we not prophesied in thy name? 
And in thy name have done many wonderful works. How could they do the wonderful works without prayer? Yes, they know how to pray, but I will say unto them in that day, I never knew you depart from me, ye that walk in iniquity. You better have the love. The love. If that is the will of God, he will plant the love in your heart. Entering into the marriage union without love is like coming into the world without a heart. As a defective heart creates untold problems for a child. Rich and poor, Christian and uh, Christian and non-Christian. You know, if a Christian has a hole in the heart, even though he's a Christian, there will be a problem. If the child of a Christian couple has a defective heart, there will be a problem. And so if a Christian goes into marriage without love, without the heart in the family, you're going to have a problem. And that's the reason why we need to understand without love, money may be there, property may be there, children may even come, all the other things may come, but they will fail to give us a healthy family. I pray that all these things we learn, we're going to make use of them profitably in Jesus' name. I divide the message today to three parts. Number one, Christ-like love of the husband at home. Christ-like love of the husband at home. Number two, commitment of the wife's love in the home. The commitment of the wife's love in the home. And then number three, cooperation between the wife and the husband. Cooperation between the wife and the husband. We'll come to point number one. Christ-like love of the husband at home. It says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 again. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Likewise, your husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. The word dwell. It means live together. Live together. In these days of economy, in these days of commerce, in these days of Lifting up education above Christian life and Christian knowledge. In these days of exalting profession, exalting job, exalting gathering substance on earth, more than getting to heaven by many people, they do not understand this. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them. Before we even talk about according to, according to, according to, whether it's according to knowledge, knowledge of the word of God, and knowledge of who the woman is, but dwell with them. You know, sometimes you'll find the people that uh, they marry together. In fact, sometimes it's like, you know, somebody is in another country. And then he has known the will of God to somebody here in our country. And then he writes back here, I want to get married to someone. So it's the will of God. Do you know it's the will of God? Well, we met uh, at the retreat about six years ago before I left Nigeria. And now that, uh, you know, I'm over there, I'm just seeing her every time. It's like she's the will of God. How do you plan to dwell together? Well, I'll just come home and I have only two weeks to spend at home. And then within the two weeks, they, do the, they have the marriage ceremony. And they bring the union together. Three days after that uh, union together, the man has traveled back again. And the woman is here. You likewise, she husbands dwell together. Dwell together. But, um, you know, she cannot get visa. Dwell together. Dwell together. Come back home. Dwell together. Which one is more important? For you to take a wife and stay with the wife. Or to go and stay in another country looking for money. Money without happiness. Money without family. Money without satisfaction. Money without taking care of your wife. Money without children. Money without enjoying the privilege of the marriage. What is that? 
Likewise ye husbands dwell with them. Live together. You know, sometimes it's similar in the same country over here that, uh, you know, the, the woman says, I am doing some postgraduate work. Why don't you finish that before you come into the marriage union? And then after, you know, after the marriage, where the marriage on Saturday or Monday, she's gone back to college. And then the man is here. He's still carrying this um, smoking uh, stove and still pumping this and that. And the eyes of the man are red. I will say, what happened to you? My stove it gave me a problem. I thought you got married last Saturday or my wife has gone back to college. What kind of marriage is that? And likewise, she husbands dwell with them. Dwell together. Live together. This is the standard of the word of God. You know, sometimes when you say, I belong to Deeper Life Bible Church. But are you walking by the Bible? Do you organize your, uh, your family according to the Bible? Bible Church. Dwell together. That means you are living together. You are not running off looking for money, looking for this and looking for that. And you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes the wife is sick. And as the wife is sick, you know, the man in search of money, in search of green pastures, he just says, uh, my wife, you know, what am I going to do now? And the woman says, well, I know what you are going for. I release you. If I die, I go to heaven. Even though she says she releases you, that does not release you. That does not release you. Your wife can tell you to do something that, you know, is not according to the Bible. There's sometimes that, you know, the wife would say, I know I'm having problem having children. You can go to other women and have children. Are you going to do that if you're a Christian? Because your wife says, you can do it. I permit you. Go and get children. Any other place? No, you cannot do that. That your wife permits you. And it says, yes, I'm dying. But all the same, I release you. Go and look for money. And then you may leave any way you like. Likewise ye husbands dwell with them. That's the word of God. And it says to dwell with them according to knowledge giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel as, and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. How can you pray and have the prayers answered if you are living outside the will of God? If the basic things of marriage, you are not obeying it, then you are praying. How will God answer the prayer? So then we need to understand, when it says dwell together, one, physically, dwell together. Stay in the same home, stay in the same house, and live in the same place. And you know, sometimes uh, those of us who are coming here to the Bible study, and all of you listening to me over there, when I say some of these things you don't understand, there are some people, they say they're husbands and wives, and they say that they are Bible believers, they're living under the same roof, but not in the same room. They cannot stay together in the same room. The man has his own reason why he's living in a separate room. And he says, please, anytime I come near to you, I have attack, I have affliction, I have oppression. There is a personality. And because I don't understand the reason why you stay in that room, I will stay in this room, dwell together. That's the Bible. What if we have problem? Dwell together and pray. If you separate, already you go against the Bible. And if you go against the Bible and then you say you are praying, your prayers will be hindered. As you look at the word of God then, what a challenge. And this is the reason we need to actually find out the will of God before we get into it. Because when it says to dwell together, number one, physically. Number two, in, a, in an emotional way. In an emotional way. In a psychological, in a spiritual way. In an intimate way. Dwell together. That means we'll talk together. That means we'll reason together. That means we'll share together. That means 
means you are going to commune together. That means you are sharing your heart and sharing your mind. It's not just, it, it doesn't terminate in the physical. You dwell together. There's an intimacy in between you that you don't find between you and any other person on the face of the earth. Ah, and sometimes your mother is there. And you have not, uh, you know, uh, you have not caught what they call the umbilical cord. It's like even though you are 37, you are 47, you are still like a baby. And your mother is living with you. And anytime you come back from work, instead of dwelling together, staying together, having this intimacy, conversation, heart to heart talk, and understanding with your wife, you go to your mother. And there you are more intimate with your mother than with your wife. What an unscriptural stand. Dwell together with your wife. And sometimes it's the woman uh, that, you know, it's like, uh, you know, you're married to the church. You know, sometimes uh, those of us, especially a person like me that, you know, talks about evangelism a lot. And I talk about serving the Lord a lot. And we talk about uh, the work in the church, the work in the church. You know, the pastor wants the church to grow. And I want the church to grow. And I want, you know, all these women ministries and all these men, you know, coming to the church and doing this and doing that. And how, how I love it. You know, as the people are preaching and they are praying and they are singing and, you know, they do everything. And then new members are coming and they're doing the follow-up. And we say, this is wonderful. An active church, a wonderful church, a beautiful church. But... The church activities separate you from your wife. The church activities separate you from your husband. And we're so busy in church work that there is no time at all to dwell together. To dwell together. The work is so much. And you know, we have to make ends meet. And therefore, we wake up in the morning. And when we wake up in the morning, we're so much in a hurry. If you don't hurry up, especially in the, in the big cities, you are going to miss your boss. And then you are going to get late. And you might get queried. Therefore, you wake up early in the morning. And then you quickly do what you call quiet. But you know that kind of quiet time. That's not, that's not intimate. This is just, you know, we read some things in the scripture. What do you say about it? What do I say about it? And we're, we're, we're looking at the time and then we hurry up and everybody will pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And then we quickly take our breakfast. In fact, uh, if I talk about the way some people eat, that's why we're not healthy. Because when you eat, you eat, you must eat patiently and you eat slowly and you, know, you enjoy, you enjoy your meal. That's another story. That's another subject. Maybe one day I'll teach you on how to eat. Look up at me here. You know that I know how to eat. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, but some people, they don't know how to eat. They hurry up like that, and then they are gone. And then when they are coming, they will not come back to the house. They come, they come from work. They go to the church on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, on Friday, there's an, on Saturday. And then, of course, on Sunday, every day of the week, and there's no intimacy. We never plan in the family. And we never talk in the family. We never converse in the family. We never share together in the family. Although we are not divorcing because of doctrine, but we are tolerating our families, just tolerating one another. There is no intimacy. We don't know the mind of the man. It's too much in church. It's good to go to church. And it's too much in the place of work. It's good to go to the place of work. Where is the time of intimate talking together, sharing together? Therefore, we need to regulate everything. And nobody in the church here, Deeper Life Bible Church, will say that he is busier than myself. Yes, I am busy. Yes, I do a lot of things. I run here, I run there. But I make sure that, you know, this side of my life is still well taken care of. There is uh, virtually nothing about me that my wife does not know. And there is virtually absolutely nothing about her that I do not know. And we're very intimate. We're very close. And it says dwell together. And, uh, you know, we go almost everywhere almost together. I said almost because, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, I don't, in biology, I didn't learn this. But, you know, at home, uh, they used to tell me that women have nine rib bones, but women have how many? Okay, you heard it, but it's not true. Uh, 
but you know, because we men are stronger, once in a while, maybe like one or two times in the year, I may say, okay, stay at home and rest, and then I jump off. But even when I jump off like that, I land over there, thank God for telephone. I call immediately or she calls immediately. And every night we still talk together, even though I may not be there physically. But you know some people, they don't understand. They're too busy, too busy. That there's no intimate fellowship and relationship interaction between them and their wives. And they put the blame on the church. And they say, my wife, you understand, you know, deeper life. This is my position. What's your position that makes you so busy? There's no intimacy and dwelling together. I come back to this, uh, verse 7. Likewise, ye husbands dwell with them. According to what? According to knowledge. Giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. And as being heirs together of the grace of life. That your prayers be not hindered. In Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Reading from verse 25. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church. Love your wives even as Christ also loved the church. Again, you come back to knowledge. If you depend on feeling, that's literally impossible. Because, you know, at the times you feel bad, you feel sick, you feel unhappy, you feel tired. If you, when you feel unhappy, you don't, you, you don't do things as when you feel happy. If you depend on, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm up, I'm down. I am rich, I am poor, I'm disappointed, I'm encouraged, and I'm belittled, I'm exalted. If you depend on those changes, circumstances in life, you'll be acting according to feeling. But when you know that this is knowledge, and it says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And you cannot be Christ-like if you don't have Christ living on the inside of you. The first thing to do is to have Christ living inside you. And when Christ is inside you, he will live the life out through you. That's why we're told in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live... In the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. That's it. I live by the faith of the Son of God. I live by the faith of the Son of God. He doesn't say, I live by the feeling and emotion in my mind, in my body. You no, know, if you live by emotion and feeling, you're not going to live right. You're not going to, you're not going to do what, what needs to be done. You know, at times, you don't feel smiling. There are times you don't feel like even talking. There are times you don't feel like being expressive. But when you act like Christ, you just do what you need to do. Feeling or no feeling. Because now you live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And then we're told how Jesus actually loved. We're told in John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Christ-like love. In the family, John chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 9. As, my, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. You know, sometimes as you look at our relationship, uh, there's something you call conditional love. There's something you call unconditional love. Conditional love is uh, you do well, I love you. You act right, I love you. And you prepare my food in time and it's not late, I love you. And you clean up the house and this is the way I want you. And you always do it like that, I love you. If you don't, I don't love you. That's conditional love. Unconditional love means I love you for who you are. What does that mean? Because you are wife. That's all. Not because of you're too fat, you're slim, 
you control your wage. Not because of that. Not because you speak good English. Or because you learn another language. Or because you respect my mother. Yes, I want you to respect my mother. But unconditional love means I love you for who you are. Because you are wise. Because God has given you to me. Therefore, I love you. Unconditional love. I love you when I'm happy. I love you when I'm sad. Yes, sadness is part of life. There are times we go to our places of work and what you meet in the place of work just batters you, just throws you off balance. And then you come back home, you love your wife, unconditional love. No matter how you're feeling, no matter what you're going through, no matter what challenges you're facing in your place of work, unconditional love. You know, sometimes a woman is able to contribute to the upkeep of the family and she's able to raise some money and says my husband here is money i just got this uh, profit in my business well wonderful you take it and then you share it together and then how do we spend it you discuss together and sometimes the woman is not able to bring any money home and you still love unconditional love you know sometimes uh, the woman is uh, you know uh, having a uh, children and the children are all girls and you still love the woman because this is unconditional love. And sometimes the woman does not have a child as yet. And you still love the woman because this is unconditional love. And sometimes, uh, you know, your parents are saying, this is a woman. We don't like this about her. We don't like this about her. You respect your parents. You are not rude to them. But you say, well, I understand what you're saying. But I love my wife. What we're saying, don't you understand? don't you accept yes i understand what you're saying but you know the, co uh, the covenant i have with the lord is to obey the word of the lord and i love my wife unconditionally unconditionally you know sometimes the wife is very strong and she never gets sick and in the whole year she never goes to the hospital she never asks for prayer for anything always strong always running here and there and almost stronger than the man and you love her for that but then sometimes she breaks down because she's not stoned and then you have to go to the kitchen yourself and prepare the meals. You love her all the same. Unconditional love. Unconditional love. And you know sometimes, uh, you know some people feel that this woman is not uh, doing this for me, not doing that for me. Because you have a wrong understanding of marriage. God has not given you the woman so that she will do everything perfectly every day. She has given, he has given you that woman for you to be her teacher, her trainer, her coach. And there are some things that she doesn't know how to do well. And you love her unconditionally like Christ loved the church. Why? Because you are a coach. Because you are a trainer, because you are an instructor, because you are a counselor, because you are a teacher. And God has given you that woman to train her and coach her and lift her up and make her the person she ought to be. It's not because she is perfect already. You know, I would love my wife if she were perfect. No, there's nothing like that. Because, you know, Jesus loved all his disciples even when they were not perfect. Because Jesus was to save them. Jesus was to sanctify them. Jesus was to teach them. And Jesus was to wash them and cleanse them. And because he knew this is my responsibility, I love them. Can you teach somebody you don't love? Can you coach somebody you don't love? And can you lift up somebody you don't love? Can you counsel somebody you don't love? Can you build up somebody's life when you don't love him, you don't love her? If God has given her to you to coach her, to train her, and to teach her, and to develop her, it is not because she has got all the teaching you love her. You love her so she can get your teaching. You know, if you don't love her, whatever you want to teach, she says, I'm not listening to you. I can't hear you. I, know, I hear what you're saying, but I don't understand. Your frown and your anger, your aggressiveness, and the way you treat me doesn't make me to accept you as my teacher. I'm here, I'm here. It's like I'm in the prison here. And when she's feeling that I'm in the prison in this marriage, you cannot teach 
teach her anything. It's the love. It's the love. The love is a foundation, unconditional love. That's what will make you to be able to help her. In John chapter 15, John chapter 15, I'm reading from verse, uh, from verse 12. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. The same way Jesus loved unconditionally. That's the way you are to love your, uh, your wife. Or oh, you say, I don't think I can do that. Yes, you can. You know, sometimes I'm surprised when some people have children. And these children, they are wayward children. They are terrible children. And they're very difficult children. And then the teacher, the school will drive them away. They don't come to school, they dismiss them. And even in church, some of the church people that you know, have not learned about this conditional love, they'll say, you know, we cannot, we don't want this child in our church. We don't want this child in our district. But you know what the father does? The father says, well, what can I do? It's my child. I will still call the child. You see, give the child food and teach the child. And then you see the child down. You say, child, see what you are doing. You spoilt our name. Everybody that sees us, this is what they think about us. But what can we do? Please, please change. And you still love the child. If you can love the child like that, why can't you love your wife like that? That, yes, you don't understand this, you don't like this, you don't like that, but you must still love where we love. I said where we love. Then in verse 13, it says, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Christ said, love, you will lay down what you have for your wife. Lay down, lay down, lay down. And what does that mean to lay down? Look up here. It means, you know, this paper in my hand, if I'm carrying it like this and I put it inside my pocket and I'm hiding it, am I laying it down? Let's say this paper is currency, dollar, pound sterling. And then every time, anywhere I'm going, you know, I lock the door, I lock the wardrobe, I lock everything, and then at, when, as I'm going out, did I lock everything? I go back again, I check up, did I lock everything? And then I had that thing, and then if I don't, if I'm, if I'm thinking maybe this woman may have a duplicate key, I go back there, open the thing, and then I take all my currency and put it inside here. Am I laying it down? No. But to lay it down means like this, I put it here and I say, my dear, look at this in here. What is this? It's dollars. <laughs> and then I say, now I've laid it down and it's, it's available. And we can spend it together. That's marriage. But you know when you're hiding it, but it says, Jesus laid down his life for his friends, for the church. And it says, Christ like love. This is how we're going to do it. And you know, when you do it, there's something that this does in our lives. It gives you a sense of feeling that now I'm a man. Now I can sacrifice. Now I'm a husband. Now I I'm obeying the Bible. You feel happy. You feel confident. You feel self-esteem. And you feel that, what? Me, of all people, I can lay down this. Lord Jesus, I am like you now. I lay it down. You know, the joy it will give you. But you know, if you're hiding it and hiding every time, the guilt you have. And the absence of the presence of God in your life. And the void in your life. The emptiness in your life that you are feeling all the time. That, you know, it looks like I'm not able to lay anything down. It is selfishness in me. And I'm talking of being sanctified. I thought I was sanctified. But I see the selfishness every time. Lay down. And then we're told in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2. Ephesians chapter 5. I'm looking at verse 2, and walk in love, and walk in love, and walk in love. Uh, this word walk, walk. And there are various ways in which you look at the word walk. In fact, when a child is born, before the child starts walking, the parents are very eager. 
that this child has not started walking. And when the child begins to take a few steps and is walking, how the parents are happy. How the Heavenly Father must be looking at us if we have not started walking in love in our families. And then all of heaven is looking at us. He has not started walking. He has not started walking. You know, when you have a child and then the child is, you know, growing up and people come to your house and they say, how old is your child now? And you see, it's uh, three years of age. Uh, three years and the child has not started walking. It puts almost like a dagger in your heart. And you say, child, walk. Child, walk. And then the child gets up and falls now again, the sorrow that you have, the sorrow that heaven has that you have been married for uh, for three years, for five years, for ten years, and you cannot walk in love, and walk in love. And now I understand we have to learn how to walk. It doesn't just happen by itself. Walk in love. Learn how to walk in love. And the steps to take, the steps to take, just take a step each day. And then as you do that, it's consistent. You do it now, you do it now, you do it now. And then eventually you're able to walk. And in fact, you, you know, those who tell us about exercises they tell us that you know walking is good for your heart walking is good for your body to keep you in shape and to keep you strong and healthy and agile that walking is very necessary in the christian life in the christian family walking is like exercise and it gives you the shape and it gives you the the strength and the family you walk in love it says you walk in love as christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to god for his sweet smelling savor i pray god will help us to do it if that is uh, understanding the character and the characteristic of the husband, how about the wife? Point number two, commitment of the wife's love in the home. The commitment of the wife's love in the home. In Titus chapter 2, Titus chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 3, Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 3. It says, uh, and the aged women likewise. Hey, look at this word again, likewise. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. That the aged women be in behavior as becometh holiness. Not false accusers, not giving too much wine, teachers of good things. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, and to love their children. That they may teach. Now, uh, there are many ways of teaching. But the most effective way of teaching is teaching by example. The most effective way of teaching is teaching by example. Have you noticed how our children, they go to school, and then they go every day. They go every day to school from Monday to Friday, and then they come back. The following week, they are gone again. The following month, they are gone again until they take exam, and then they take uh, vacation. And then when they have gone out of school, they, you know, they now leave school. What percentage of the knowledge that they learned in school, do they make use of in life? Let's check up. And what percentage of geography that you learned in school do you make use of every day today? Not much. What percentage of history you learned in school? Many, many years of history, history class that you learned. What percentage of that are you using today? Not much. What percentage of mathematics you learned in school? Are you using today? All those things they taught us in school, what percentage of that maths are you using today? Not much. What percentage of chemistry or physics, biology, or any other subject you learned in school are you using today? Not much. Then we're at home, and mommy is just talking a particular way. And mommy is just looking a particular way. Or mommy is just standing a particular way. Or mommy is just singing a particular chorus every time in the kitchen. Or mommy is, you know, just uh, calling the children and has a tone of voice and also has a pet name that she calls the child every time. And then the child grows up. What percentage of uh, the mother's habit? 
the mother's lifestyle, the mother's way of looking, the mother's way of dressing, the mother's way of relating with people, and the mother's way of dealing with the father, relating with the husband. What percentage of teaching the mother gave is the child using today much, much, a higher percentage than the percentage of history and geography we're using today. What I'm telling you is the mother does not teach like the primary school teacher, like the mathematics teacher in the school, but she teaches by example. And that teaching that that child learns at home from the parents, just by just living together, just watching one another, just see what mother is saying, what daddy is saying. And you know, sometimes uh, a daddy does not know himself until he looks at his boy. And then, you know, if daddy is always sitting and crossing the leg, and you know, put in the you know newspaper like this, and then put in the eyeglasses on the nose, and uh, you know the child grows up. And as the child grows up now, you know, daddy visits the child in his room, and then daddy sees uh, the boy crossing the leg and putting the glasses on the nose and putting the papers like this, and daddy sees himself. He sees himself. Why? Because, you know, we teach by example. All these lectures and lectures, and they're good, but, you know, we don't use too much of that. And aged women, how do we teach? You teach by example. You teach by example. It's not just the, you know, the chalk board or the chalk and the duster in hand, and then you are teaching that the aged women... They be in behavior as becometh holiness. Because that is a form of teaching that makes you to influence those younger women. And you inspire those uh, younger women that they teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, and to love their children, and to be discreet. Chase keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. We need to teach, and the way we teach is teaching. We teach love by demonstrating love. We teach something good by acting out that thing that is good. In Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 15, speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. It says, speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. Aged women, we must teach the younger women to speak the truth in love. You know, there are different ways of saying the same thing. And sometimes you may tell the truth. And the truth may hurt. But you women, you know why these uh, doctors, uh, trained doctors, do you know why they, you, know, you go to the hospital? And first of all, the way they talk to you, they see that the situation is very, very serious. They know that you know, this disease, this is life-threatening. But you know, they don't just dump all their knowledge on you. The doctor speaks the truth, tells the truth. But the doctor tells the truth in love. They test you. After testing, they don't show it on their face. They know it in their heart. This is serious. Why did this woman wait so long before coming? This is life-threatening. I hope this woman survives this. That's what they are thinking in their heart. Because this, this is terrible. And then they come out. And then they put on a smile. And then they draw the chair near you. And they sit down. Because they know the nearer they come. The more you feel the intimacy and the love and the care. And then they might put uh, you know, their hands on you. And they might you know, check up their thermometer or whatever. And then check up the x-ray. And they say, uh, you know, if you, they know you're a Christian. And if they, are, they say, sister, uh, well, God is on the throne. And with God, all things are possible. And they put a smile on their face. They say, well, if we were to go by our knowledge. But you know all this knowledge. Knowledge, it doesn't really work every time. If we were to go by the knowledge, we would have said it is serious, but uh, you know, we'll try our best and we know that you'll be all right. 
He's telling the truth. You get the message, but it doesn't frighten you. And then if you appear frightened, it, it comes to you down. And it says, I take it easy, sister. And then gives you some encouraging words. And then it says, but we might have to, uh, we, he knows you need operation, but he says, we might have to perform an operation if it becomes necessary. And now you are, it's like you are being prepared, you might have an operation. Although you are hoping there may not be an operation, but the doctor really knows there's going to be an operation. But the way he puts it, we might have to perform an operation if it becomes necessary. And then, while you are thinking about that, he doesn't give you all the knowledge, everything he knows, all at a short. He leaves you alone and allows you to digest that and later comes back and he says, uh, you know, looking at the test again, looks like we have to act fast to save your life. And then eventually it takes you to the theater and why do they put you to sleep? What do they apply? Anesthetics. That is to make you not feel the pain of the cord. You know, truth cords. But if you don't put anesthetic, sometimes we just speak the truth. We say, that's the truth. But it's hurting me. Well, I don't know about that if it hurts you, but I told you the truth. Tell them the truth, but put some anesthetics. And deaden the pain. And make them feel happy. And make them feel at ease. Let grace be there. And let love be there. As we women speak the truth to her husbands. You tell the truth in love. But speaking the truth in love. May grow up into him. In all things which is the head even Christ. I pray the Lord will help us. Uh, you see that amen now? In uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, and let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. I'm wondering now, why do we ever get angry? You know why? Every time you look at the past and not at the future, you get angry. We are slow. That's in the past. We've not had a child. That's of the past. We're not looking at the future. We don't, you don't know the future. And then she did this. That's in the past. You get angry because you look at the past. And then you make, up, you make a decision on the present looking at the past. That's why you get angry. That's why there's clamor. But if you just look away from the past and you look away from the present and you look at the future, look at the man the way he will be in one year's time if you prayed for that man every day and God answers that prayer. Look at the man how he will be in five years time. If you set a goal, this man will be a great man of God. Don't look at the past, look at the future. And look at the man the way he will be in five years time. If you encouraged him, if you supported him, if you lifted him up, and if you just did everything to put all the resources you have at his disposal to be who he ought to be. Look at the man the way he will be in five years time. If you spent time time with him. If you spent money on him, if you give him some good books to read, and if you come together to say, my husband, I knew, I knew when I married you that you were going to be great, but although we have not made much progress in that line of greatness, I'm looking at five years time, I know that something great is ahead of us. If you look at the future, you are not going to be that discouraged and angry. We're looking at the past every time. What he did yesterday what he said yesterday, how he acted yesterday. And then we're thinking he's going to act the same way today. When you begin to look at the future and think of the future, you're going to let all bitterness and all wrath and all anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Now, if you want somebody to do well, you want somebody to really, really do well, how do you make a person do well, make him feel happy? Now, do you do things good when you are sad or when you are happy? When you are? 
If you wanted to do something and then somebody came to you and then he belittled you and he said and he sang with you, uh, what do you think you are? You naughty fellow, you bad fellow, you stupid fellow, you foolish fellow. And he used all the bad adjectives in the dictionary on you. Do you feel, you know, more energy to do something great? No. If you want the person to change, why do you get angry? Because anger does not change people. Anger just makes them feel little, makes them feel worthless, makes them feel non-entity, makes them feel like they're nobody. But if you want somebody to do, what's your goal? What's your goal on your husband? Do you want, you're living with a man. If he's happy, it will help you. If he's happy, it will lift you up. If he's happy, then you'll be, he'll be a nicer person to you. If you want somebody to be nice, do something that will make him want to act nice. If you want somebody to do well, do something to him that will make him to want to do well. But if you manifest anger and you manifest wrath and you manifest bitterness and clamor and evil speaking and then you malice, if you are you know, keeping quiet with somebody, how do you make the person to do? What's your goal? What's your objective? If you want somebody to do well, act to him in such a way he'll be encouraged. He wants to do well. You know, you praise him. It's like, you know, a man that uh, wasn't doing very well. And they were in a particular conference. And as they were in that conference, uh, the uh, person, the manager of the company, just introduced the man. He said, this is so and so. And I want to tell you that this man, he gave a particular good quality about him. And then the fellow felt very excited and very happy. And then gave another good equality about him. And the fellow felt, also this manager was noticing me like this, that I'm a good person, I'm, you know, I'm up and doing and all. And then he said, I'm telling you that in the very next month, this man is going to make 150% of, you know, what he has been doing. And the man felt afraid. And now it's before everybody that now that fellow has committed him that is going to do this. And the very following month, that man went out and went beyond what that manager had said. You know, encouragement makes a person to jump higher than you think they could ever jump. Love makes people to go farther. You think they could ever go. If you belittle them, you belittle your husband. You discourage your husband. If you look down on him, if you look at the past, this is what he has always been, never brings any money home, never does that, never does that. That's not going to make them to be better. But if you love them, that love will make them to jump out of themselves and do something great. And be kind, one to another, verse 32, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. We will do it. And we're going to do it effectively. In um, Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, All must love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it. Verse 28, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. They ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. And then he tells us in verse 33, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see, see to it that she reverence her husband. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. It's when we do that, then we're going to actually build them up. And then we'll, we'll be in the scriptures as well. We're told in um, Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31. I'm reading from verse 11. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. That's love. She will do him good, not evil, all the days of her life. You know, if you say you love, you must do, do something to show that you're actually love. Because love without deeds, 
Love without action. Love without corresponding behavior that matches the love is empty. It's like faith without works, dead. Faith without action, dead. Faith without corresponding behavior that matches the faith, dead. The same thing with love. Love without action, the action that corresponds to the love. Love without behavior that corresponds to the love. Love without corresponding deeds and works is dead. That's why it says, she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. And they were told in verse 26, Verse 26, she openeth her mouth with wisdom. And in her tongue is the law of kindness. It's like you make a covenant with yourself that this is the way you are going to behave, the way you are going to act, the way you are going to live, and the way you are going to relate with your husband. And you make a law that nothing dirty, nothing discouraging, nothing stupid, nothing foolish will ever come from your mouth to your husband. In Songs of Solomon chapter 8. Songs of Solomon chapter 8. I'm reading from verses 6 and 7. Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for love is strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The cause thereof a cause of fire which has a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love. Many waters cannot quench love. Now remember once again, many waters can quench emotion. Many waters can quench feeling. And many things, uh, many activities and circumstances can actually stop the feeling or the emotion or the instinct. But when it's love, a commitment of love, it's like a covenant. It's like, this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to act. I love the man. This is my husband. And because he is my husband, I make up my mind to love. It's the will coming from the heart. And it's actually that act, that decision that brings the emotion, the right emotion. Many waters cannot quench love. Neither can the floods down it. If a man will give all the substance of his house for love, it would utterly be contemned. I were told in First John, First John chapter three. I'm reading from verse fourteen. First John chapter three, verse fourteen. We know that we are passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. And if you don't love your husband, how can you love the brethren? And then he that loveth not his brother, he that she that loveth not her husband, abideth in death. Whosoever hated his brother, whosoever hated his husband, is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive with the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And if that is so, you ought to lay down your life for your husband. And then it says in verse 17, but whoso has this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him. How dwelleth the love of God in him? Read that for the wife. Whoso has this world's good, and seeth her husband have need, and shutteth up her bowels of compassion from him. How dwelleth the love of God in her? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. We come to point number three, cooperation between the wife and the husband. Cooperation between the wife and the husband. The right hand needs the left hand to keep clean and also to tie a bundle. The husband and the wife need each other to raise a happy family, a healthy family. 
a progressing family, a wonderful scriptural family, a successful family. The husband and the wife are made for cooperation. The husband and the wife are made for cooperation. And let's go back to Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. That's the origin of marriage and the family. The husband and the wife are made for cooperation. But let me very quickly say, cooperation in righteousness. Cooperation in righteousness. You see that word cooperation? Uh, we can cooperate with some people, husband and wife, can cooperate together in an evil act. And that is not the purpose of God. And let's go to chapter 3 of Genesis. Genesis chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her. And he did eat. Cooperation, agreement, but that's not good. That's not good. The Lord had said, thou shalt not eat of that fruit. And now the woman gave to the husband cooperation, cooperation. But this one, this is compromise. We're not talking about cooperation in sin, but cooperation in righteousness. Never forget that Genesis chapter 20, chapter 16. Genesis chapter 16. And now we're reading from verse 2. Genesis chapter 16 verse 2 and Sarai said unto Abraham, Behold now the Lord has restrained me from bearing. I pray thee go in, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abraham akin to the voice of Sarai. Cooperation, that's cooperation in sin. That's bad. That's terrible. That's not good. And then you see the result of that. Ishmael was born, and the world is still suffering for that today. Cooperation, yes, but cooperation in righteousness, not in unrighteousness. First Kings chapter 21. In First Kings chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 25. First Kings 21, verse 25. But... There was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. That's cooperation, but that's cooperation in sin, cooperation in evil, cooperation in wickedness. That's bad, that's not the will of God. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5, I'm reading from verse. 9. Acts chapter 5, reading from verse 9. Cooperation is good if it's in righteousness. In Acts chapter 5, verse 9, then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together? Agreement is good if it's in righteousness. Agreement is good if it's scriptural. Agreement is good if it leads us in obedience to the word of the Lord. But agreement is bad, it's evil, it's dangerous, it's deadly, it's hellish. If it doesn't lead us in the way of righteousness. And then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried their husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then she fell down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. You know that kind of agreement to agree together to sin. To agree together to tempt the spirit of God. To agree together to be wicked. To agree together to be, de to be devilish and to be hellish. That is bad. But when it comes to righteousness, when it comes to following the Lord, agreement, togetherness, fellowship, cooperation is good. And let's come to Matthew chapter 19. In Matthew chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 4. 
And he answered and said unto her, Have ye not dread that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. We are made for cooperation. And then we are told in that uh, in verse 6, Wherefore there are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together? Cooperation. Cooperation. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. What's the implication of that joining together in 1 Corinthians chapter 1? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, reading from verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. Don't contradict one another. Don't oppose one another. Always find a point of agreement. You know, there's nothing you are thinking about and talking about that you cannot find a place of agreement. And uh, you can say, maybe when you don't understand everything, my husband, I don't understand everything now, but the part I understand, I understand what, what you mean is this, this, this. I think that is good. I think we ought to start work on the area we agree. And the area we don't agree, then maybe as we go on, we'll see a better way and a better route and a better perspective, a better direction to go. But these few things we agree on at present, why don't we start working? Work on that. I think that will be a good family. You know, sometimes you are taking a decision, and the decision you are taking, uh, you might say, my husband, do we have all the facts? I think what the facts you have, and the facts I have, I think what we're saying, it looks like what you say is the best thing we're going to do. I'm just wondering, my husband, do we have all the facts to make a decision now? Or are we making a decision that is premature? And then your husband will say, wait a minute. How can we get more facts about what we're discussing? And then you go to work. And let me do my research. And you do your research. Let me ask questions from this and this and that. And then we'll bring more ideas together, more facts together, and the more facts we get together will not make us to take a different decision. You know, sometimes when we disagree, it's not because, you know, you are bad, I'm good, I'm bad, you are good. No, it's because I'm looking at it from this perspective. You're looking at it from this perspective. It's because you have these facts. You have three facts out of ten. I have these facts. I have five out of ten. And the three and the five, they make eight, and we still need more facts. Because I have five facts, different from your three facts, my conclusion will be different. And you think we're enemies. No, we're not enemies. I just have some facts you don't have. And then because you have three facts, I have five facts, I think that you don't know enough. No, sometimes three facts, those three facts might be greater, might be of more weight than the five facts I have. But you know, how to be in agreement is to say, my wife, you know, I, I'm listening to you, the facts you are giving me, I didn't think of that before. And then the wife will say, these facts you are laying down my husband, I didn't think of that before, but it looks like maybe we don't even have enough facts yet, and then we go to work, and we look for the other facts, and when we assemble all the facts together, then we can take a final decision. That's how to get into agreement. So we're not always fighting and fighting and quarreling. I don't mean boxing, I mean, you know, sometimes we fight with a look. Sometimes we fight with quietness. Sometimes we fight with, okay, if that's what you want to do, go ahead and do it, but count me out. You know, sometimes we fight, we fight psychologically in, so, in those ways, but you know, all that fighting is not necessary. It's just that I need more facts, I need more knowledge, I need more revelation, I need more truth about this, and then as we have all that, and then if I have some facts you don't have, I will not be selfish with my ideas. I throw the thing to you gently. I say, look at this, look at this, look at that. And if you have some facts I don't have, don't hold on to the facts. After all, we're going to take decision together. You give those facts to me and then increase my knowledge about this thing we're going to decide. I increase your knowledge about this thing that we're going to decide. And I can assure you, if I know the same thing you know and you know the same thing I know, we're going to arrive at the same conclusion. If you know the same 
same thing I know. And I know the same thing you know. We're going to take the same decision. Doesn't matter on any subject. And it's something learnable. We can learn it. And we can study it. And we can share it together. And once we share together, then we have all the facts. And then we're going to have the decision. And disagreements will stop in our families. In that first Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions among you. And that ye be perfectly joined together. Think about that husband and wife. That ye be perfectly joined together. Perfectly joined together. You know, sometimes, uh, you, sometimes you are developing yourself. And because you are developing yourself, your worldview is changing. Your ideas are changing. Your vision is changing. And, and the way you want to get to in life is changing. But it may be that your wife is not reading anything at all. You know, the best way, the best way to do it is this. Get a copy of that good book you are reading. It may be a book on Christianity, a book on your business, a book on, you know, personal development, whatever book it is, get a copy and let her also take a copy. And then while she is reading, she is marking the important points to her in that book. And while you are, the same book, while you are reading, you are marking the same, you know, important things to you. And then after one week at the weekend, exchange the books, the same book, the same title, but you have marked different places. Exchange. And then when she reads, she reads all the places you have marked. When you read at the you, you read all the places she had marked, and then you see what is important to her, and she sees what is important to you. After reading what you have separately marked, then you come together, and then you share ideas together. If you are growing together like that, you come to a point on every subject, on any area, you always arrive at the same decision. And when you finish, you know, this book, pick another book. And if you can take a book and read a book in a whole month, even in two months, that's a good start. Even in three months, that will be a good beginning. And then when you finish that, get another book again. The same book, the same book. You are growing together. Give her a copy and then you have a copy again. Do the same thing. You mark important things to you and she marks important things to her every weekend. Exchange and just read the places that are marked. And then when you do that, and she is growing and you are growing, you'll be surprised because you are reading that same thing together. It's like you're on the same spiritual diet together. You're on the same knowledge, diet of knowledge together. You're on the same diet of development together. In one year, you'll be looking alike. In one year, you'll be talking alike. In one year, you'll be progressing alike. And in one year, you'll be at the mountain, you'll be at the mountain top. And then all of us together, the mother and the father and the children, we're going to progress. And our families are going to be wonderful in Jesus' name. Now, before I allow you to pray, you know, sometimes you come to these Bible studies like this, and then you put the file, you put the Bible study outline back, and that is it. And then, you know, we come next Monday and we learn another thing. And then we said, what a wonderful time. For about six, seven weeks, so I just on the Bible study on marriage. And then, my brother, my sister, my question is what one idea, what one thing, what one decision did you take and you are working on it? Because it's not what we study alone. It's what you do about what we study. And uh, you know, if you don't do anything about it, nothing will happen. We'll just have the knowledge. It will be flowing in the air. And then you'll have a good marriage in the dream. And then during the day, because you're not practicing in it, the dream is not translated to reality. But you know, you go back home now with well, the commitment that all these things that we have learned, we, you know, sometimes we have laughed, sometimes we have cried, sometimes we have clapped, sometimes we have done some things after we have learned. If you take all these things we have learned together and then you go back home a step at a time, a step at a, step at a time, I'm telling you, your family, you have heaven on earth. Give me a good amen. amen. Am I shouting? I know you are saying, Amen. Praise the Lord.
Let's rise up now. We're going to talk to the Lord in prayer. You're going to tell the Lord the things we have learned. Some of these are wonderful, wonderful things we have learned. You want to take everything to the Lord in prayer. Say, Lord, Lord, help me. Help me, Lord. I want to fulfill this and I want to do this just a little at a time. A little at a time. And the Lord is going to bless every one of us. Make up your mind and take a quality decision. You are going to do it. It's the doing. It's the doing. It's the doing. Practice. Acting it out. Living it out. That is what gives us the happiness and the joy and the progress and the fulfillment in our families. We'll do it. We will do it. A commitment. A commitment. This is to make you happy. If your wife is happy, you'll be happy. If your husband is happy, you'll be happy. When you're happy, you'll be healthy. There'll be no worry. There'll be no anxiety. There'll be no restlessness. There'll be no sorrow. There'll be no secret tears. When our families are the way they ought to be. This is for your good. This is good medicine. Medicine to your spirit, to your soul, to your body, to your family. This is something that will make you healthy, happy, holy, fulfilled in life. Do something about it. You will build your home. If you don't, nobody will do it for you. The teacher can teach you. But can he make your home better if you don't do something about what you learn? Make a commitment to the Lord. That the knowledge you have learned today and in the previous studies... You're going to start working on them, putting them to practice. And the grace and the strength of God will help you. Let there be love in your family.